Do you think Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, John Blake, ultimately becomes Robin? Yes, I do. Yes, I think that was the idea. Um, now all they need is the money to make the movie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gary Oldman, and Esquire have asked me to explain a few things in this very creaky chair. Let's dive in, shall we? Your characters have had some of the most diverse hairstyles. How important is hair or a prop in creating your characters? Well, as you can see, hair's not a terribly important to me. <laughs> well, they're all different. There's things that you start with. Sometimes you start with the hair. Sometimes you start with the voice. Sometimes it's the physicality of the character. Actually, I like being um, a natural. And it just so happens that I've had a career where I'm in loads of makeup and I'm always in wigs. I don't know how that happened. Give me a t-shirt and a bit of brill cream any day. Of all the iconic characters you've created, and there have been some, who would you most like to sit down and have a meal with? Herman Mankiewicz would be a lot of fun. It would probably be a very liquid lunch with Herman. Dracula. That might be a liquid lunch too, thinking about it now. I would offer him a glass of wine and he would say, I never drink wine. What's the most intense prosthetic you've had to undergo for a role? Well, you've got the picture right there, Hannibal. That took six and a half hours. I had no eyelids in the character. It wasn't, you know, he had no lips and he had no eyelids. I had two pads that were stuck and anchored to my lids. And then I had two ones here, and they were in little tubes that ran down underneath the makeup, and they anchored sort of to a third nipple. And when we did a take, they would pull down my eyelids and pull up my eyes. And then there was a technician who was on, uh, you know, watering my eyes sort of every sort of minute. So I think we got it down to about five and a half, but initially it was about six and a half hours. Are you still regularly recognised on the street as Sirius Black? Well, I'm lucky in a way that I'm not hugely recognised and I do kind of m move around pretty inconspicuously. Actually, it's a funny anecdote. I was uh, not camping, I was glamping years ago in uh, El Capitan and I ran into my dentist who said, my son's over there, he would love to meet you. Um, he loves Sirius Black. And it was this bunch of kids sitting around. I said, I'm Sirius Black. And he looked at me and a kid at the end of the thing said, no, you're not, you're Commissioner Gordon. Oh, look at that sweet picture of me and Dan. WB recently said they'd be interested in another Harry Potter film. Would you be open to coming back? I can't come back. I went through the veil. I'm dead. Sirius Black is dead. A little boy once said to me, he said, oh, oh, what's on the other side of the veil? I said, Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> People still talk about the ambiguous endings for Christian Bell's Bruce Wayne in The Dark Knight Rises. How did you interpret it? Well, he found love, finally. I think it's a happy ending and a wonderful resolve for the resolution for the character. Do you think Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, John Blake, ultimately becomes Robin? Yes, I do. Yes, I think that was the idea. Um, now all they need is the money to make the movie. <laughs> How did you prepare for your character for Sid and Nancy? Funny enough, in this picture, I'm wearing a, that necklace that he had, the padlock. That was actually his. I didn't take bass lessons because that would have just done him a disservice, wouldn't it? You are the original hot vampire. Who did you base your character on? Honestly, I just made him up. I mean, those wonderful costumes and that world that Coppola had created for us. It's very, very easy to exist in that, or in that in that world. What's your favorite thing about Coppola as a director? Well, he's arguably one of the greatest living directors. It's the, the size of everything and the vision of everything. 
a film student asks me what they, what they should watch, I always recommend that they watch um, Godfather Part Two in storytelling, cinematography, costume, acting. It is absolutely, a, I think, a, a masterpiece and one of the great couple of movies. Explain to Americans the irony behind Slough House. Well, here's the thing. You have the hub, MI5. It's the glossy, snazzy uh, heart of the service. And um, they don't fire you if you mess up. They just move you over to Slough House. That world at Slough House is so far removed from MI5 that it may as well be in Slough. You and Kristen Scott Thomas have a great screen energy. Favourite thing about scenes with her. I just think she's very talented. We get on and we work well together. And we had a wonderful time in Darkest Hour, so that's lovely to be sort of be re reconnected with her and, and um, working with her again. Why do you have a picture of Pauline on your pack? Who came up with the spit enunciations in your friend's sketches? That was in the script. It was purely written in and um, lovely Matt LeBlanc. We spent a, yeah, an afternoon spitting at one another. They were looking for someone and I think he may have put my name in the hat. I, I, I think, you know, they called and said, would you like to come in and, and do it? I, you could get used to it, I'm telling you. They had these beautiful dressing rooms, they were all done out and the craft service was wonderful. You came in on the Monday, you did the read through, you went away, you might come back on a Wednesday, couple of rewrites, block it on a Thursday and Friday you shoot it and you're home by dinner for a million bucks a week. I could get used to that. I hope that um, you've, you've enjoyed this brief moment with, uh, with, with Gary Oldman. Yeah, you've maybe learned a little bit, a few little inside things from from the world of Gary Oldman. And um, 